Hello? Yeah, hello? Hi there. Um, yeah, I know we don't have long, so I'll just like um, jump in. Basically, I'm a Kent University student, um, and I'm looking to, looking to the state of British basketball for our uh, university podcast and also for possibly my dissertation. So, uh, yes, yeah, so thank you so much for talking to me. That's a pleasure. Okay, uh, I'll just jump in. Um, Adam Silver recently stated he wants basketball to be the second sport in the UK and across the globe. Uh, how achievable do you think this is for Britain? Um, I mean, it's, it's perfectly achievable for basketball to be the second or third, or it doesn't really matter than the rank, but one of the major contributing sports in terms of the number of people participating, the number of people engaged, the number of people who want to watch it. Absolutely that the, the sport itself has that potential. Um, I'm not convinced that the people who currently um, are the custodians of the sport um, are as capable or as willing for that to be the, the outcome as, as, they, as they say. Okay. Uh, do you feel there's just too many sports in the UK for basketball to try and climb over? Is it seen as uh, maybe too Americanized? No, that's not the problem with it at all. Um, the, the problem is not that, that the sport is, is North American in origin. The problem is that the sport is unbelievably poorly administered in this country. And, and I'm not really talking about um, England basketball, for example. As a, as, I'm not really talking about them per se. But just from top to bottom, every, every area, there are just there's political infighting and people trying to carve their pound of flesh out of the, a fetus. Mm. Um, it just is, and so the sport suffers. And, and more importantly than that, the young people who, who might have transformative experiences through basketball suffer. Okay. Uh, but then, in comparison, is the administration the problem when you compare basketball success in uh, countries in Eastern Europe and Spain? Uh, what's the difference between us and them? The difference between us and them is, um, oh, well, hold on, sorry, sorry, I've got a, something else. It's just I'm just going to end. How do I end that? Oh God! <laughs> ah, there we go. That's done it. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, so the differences are in France and Spain, they have both 30 centers of standardized excellence in basketball around the country. Now, mm. they have bigger countries than we do, so we wouldn't perhaps need a 30. But they have, uh, in France, for example, being a coach is a degree level course, not something you get as a dad over the weekend. In France and Spain, and Italy and Germany, they have a thriving um, professional basketball league that it acts as an aspirational tug for young people to stay, to, to enter and stay in basketball rather than going off and doing some other sport where their physical gifts will be better rewarded. Now, all of these are ways that we that we have failed. We don't have that. We have a handful of pockets of excellence in coaching. We have a handful of pockets of affordable facilities we have less than that in terms of really inspirational characters uh, working with young people and uh, as such the sport suffers and uh, last year uh, the olympic committee withdrew funding completely for basketball putting it on the same level as um, synchronized swimming um was that the killer blow for british basketball or has there been a resurgence no it's not there's nothing to do uk sport funding I mean, it very clearly has nothing to do with the sport as a whole. It has, only has something to do with the national team. Mm. So it's a blow to the national team, but a, a blow that the national team knew about. They were given a set of criteria that they needed to meet. They lied to themselves and to other people that they would meet those criteria. They went about developing a team that had no possibility of any future uh, uh, development as a unit because it was too old. Uh, mm. And then are surprised somehow when the funding is is removed. I want to make it clear that I don't agree with the no compromises of uh, UK sport approach as it stands currently for the next couple of days anyway, until their new report comes out. Okay. But 
it's not that's not what's killing basketball. What's killing basketball is terrible management, um, insiders who, who who won't let go of their position of power until they they've got what they believe they deserve out of the sport, and an entirely pervasive disregard for best practice across the country. That's what's killing the sport. Okay, so just sort of uh, ram that question off. Um, theoretically, if you had omnipot- omnipotent power over British basketball, what would what would you do to fix it? I would appoint a commissioner, and the commissioner would have, um, let's say, a seven-year, maybe eight-year tenure. And during that tenure, what he said, what she said, would be exactly what we did. If you didn't want to do those things, all license for you to operate within the structures of British basketball would be removed. You don't want to do the coach CPD, the, 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 you know, the, the kind of extra training that we know is so necessary for our coaches, then you're out. You want to operate some kind of semi-professional, not paying a living wage league, then you're out. You want to operate in a facility that you refuse to upgrade or you know you refuse to, to, to make the requisite standard, then you're out. And it would reduce, it would shrink the size of the basketball offer mm. temporarily over the early years, but it would also mean that the money was distributed through people who are actually doing the right thing. And it would force people to collaborate in a way that they don't now. Instead of having teams on each other's doorstep fighting constantly about supposed talent, they would be forced to consolidate, work together for the benefit of the young people under the auspices of one overarching vision of of moving forward. That's what saved the NBA. It's what, in fact, saved French basketball. The idea that even though they had a committee, it was consolidated under the leadership of one or two people. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, you've now spoken about the potential of the, the, the Premier League Basketball League, um, and you and Deng have both been quoted as being supporters of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is your view on that, and how and how close is that coming to fruition? I'm not... Uh, I mean, I've said it before, and people don't seem to believe me. I'm not an insider <laughs> with this, so I, I don't have any unique okay. knowledge of, of its business working. I just, this is what I know. A league that is well funded to the tune of 25 or 30 million pounds, that is centrally run much in the manner of the, of the MLS, that institutes a minimum wage for British players that is actually a, a working career wage instead of the 7,000 odd pounds that they get paid now. That's a good thing for British basketball. And I don't care if it's the Premier League basketball people or if it's some other group, I don't care who it is. I just think that British kids deserve an aspirational, fully professional league in this country and and that the sport will thrive better with that in place rather than the, you know, I don't know, Saturday morning car boot version of basketball we have right now. Right. Uh so, ignoring the uh, the administration, uh, what would you say would the main problem with basketball in the country be? Would it be the lack of facilities or the lack of funding? There is, I mean, as with any problem, it's nuanced and it doesn't have a kind of Twitter-length answer. It's The problem is we have a paucity of high-quality coaches. We have a, a, an almost total lack of coaches who are willing to take on ongoing CPD and improve themselves or even admit that they need improvement we have a, a lack of affordable quality facilities for young people. Uh, we have a lack of a cohesive ladder. That means that when you arrive in the sport at age six uh, or seven, there is a there is a pathway you can see that takes you all the way through to professional or at least elite national team level. Um, it's amateurish, mm-hmm. but all of these things contribute in kind of a gestalt way to make the sport not as successful as it should be. Right. Um, in the US, uh, sport is seen as a way into education, whereas here it's seen as sort of a way out. In many ways, people look to sport as a way, as a different way to make money. Um, as going through that system yourself at Penn State, do you believe that that sort of system, like sports scholarships, etc., could work in this country? Oh, yeah, we know it could work in this country because it works in this country for rowing and it works in this country for rugby in some places. So we know it works. It's just universities 
haven't invested in the way that they should into that right now. Um, and also, basketball's not done itself any favors in that universities know that they get great kudos from from highly skilled rowing and highly skilled uh, rugby teams. And we haven't yet put basketball in a sphere where a highly skilled basketball team is, is considered an asset. So there's work that, that the, the sport itself needs to do to elevate the status of basketball to one where having a highly skilled basketball team is all of a sudden something to be proud of and something that you should be supporting and funding. Okay. Uh, and just finally, um, obviously you had success in, in basketball, but I saw on Twitter yesterday you at the US Embassy in London. Yeah. Uh, how does it feel to sort of transcend sport a little bit, get away from it, get away from that label? Are you proud of yourself for getting away from that and yeah. becoming something more than just a sportsman? Oh, God, yes. I'd be really disappointed if all I was is a former sports person. Um, you know, I, I love the fact that my job as a psychologist now, um, my kind of, it's not really political, but semi-political movement gives me a different type of access and a different type of career now than I had when I played. Um, it's a continuation and, and, you know, there can be no doubt that my previous career very much assists for the most part and and informs my current but it, 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 I think you're absolutely right. There's something feels quite special about the fact that I've moved past just talking about that day in 99 when I scored that basket or that time that I played against Jordan or whatever else to something a bit more meaningful. That's brilliant. Um, and just finally, finally, uh, what are your hopes for the future of British basketball? I hope that the people who are currently in the way of British basketball will get out of the way of British basketball success so that young people can have the kind of sport that they deserve. I hope that people will stop doing this nonsense thing where they suggest that criticizing the status quo is part of the problem because I'm a psychologist and most of the people who are talking about this nonsense aren't. And the truth is that the only way you, you make for a better future is by acknowledging the status quo and acknowledging the challenges that we face realistically first. Okay, that's that's fantastic. Thank you so much for this. That's a pleasure. No problem. Lovely. Um, cheers. Thank you, Lizzie.